Well, good afternoon. I'm so glad to see so many of you here on such a sunny afternoon. You're not camping any place, except you're camping out here at Persimmon. And right after this, you're going to go play 18 holes of golf, or in my case, one hole. But it takes me 18 holes to get to that one hole. So I want to really thank you all for being here. My name is Lynn Snodgrass. I'm the CEO of the best darn chamber in the Pacific Northwest. It's on record now, so yes, we've got that going. It's called Gresham Area Chamber, so there you go. That's where I am. Um, I want to thank our presenting sponsors, Portland General Electric and Columbia Bank. Robin Dodge Little is from Columbia Bank. Thank you very much. And those cute little blue couches all over the place are not to sit in, they're to look at. So David, don't sit on them this time, okay. I also want to thank our stakeholder sponsor, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media. I want to thank Keith, who is a gimp today because he broke something, a foot, broke a foot. So you brought Tony with you. Thank you for doing that. Um, the replay schedules are on the registration table. So when you hear all the wonderful information you're going to hear today and you want to hear it again because you didn't quite get it, or you could tell your friends, the replay schedule is out on the registration table. Be sure and pick one up. And now I wanted to uh, recognize some of our elected officials that are here today. Councillor Carolyn Eccles. Councillor, thank you for being here today. And if you want to show up today at 3 o'clock, she's going to be running the um, council meeting today. So come and applaud her for taking, taking over that responsibility today. And we have two former com um, county commissioners. Right now, I would like to introduce Multnomah County, former Multnomah County Commissioner, Diane McKeel. There she is. Hi, Diane. And we have a Clackamas County, former Clackamas County Commissioner with us today, too, Tootie Smith. Hi, Tootie. Thanks for being here. I don't know what brought all these X's in, but we're glad to have you. You don't say X's with, um, with elected officials. You say former, and that's what they are. We also would like to recognize our chamber board members that are with us today. From Gresham Sanitary Services, Matt Miller. Matt, thank you for being here. Are you tempted to golf after this? Or do you have work to do? Yeah? OK. Well, I thought maybe you brought your father so that he could help give you competition on the field. OK. Um, and Councillor Carolyn Eccles is on our board. You could applaud her again. Thank you. And Warner Allen, who you'll meet in just a minute, Warner Allen from LLP, uh, from Warren Allen LLP. He's the chair of the Government Affairs Council. And you'll, he'll be up here in just a minute. So I always try to do something a little different with our, oh, is Jim Hathaway here? Jim Hathaway, who's my boss, it's giving me a review in a week. I just kind of blew that one, there we go. The president of our chamber, Jim Hathaway, who didn't, you weren't on my first list, Jim, I'm so sorry, and embarrassed. Pl applaud him again to get me out of the hook. No, I'm kidding, thank you. Um, and thank you, Carolyn, for getting me out of trouble for a long period of time. All right, now back to the centerpieces. I try on occasion to do something interesting and fun with our centerpieces, and today was interesting and fun and a little overwhelming. What you have in front of you are all of the bills that were passed this last legislative session. And that's what happens when you try to... <laughs> so there were... <clears throat> 2,768 bills introduced, 2,768. 701 of those bills passed the House, 795 passed the Senate, but only a mere 632 made it to the governor's desk to be signed. So if you've read a bill before, you know that there's multiple pages of a bill, and not every word on those, page, on those pages are new language, but there's probably an average of five to seven pages per bill that's introduced. So if there's about 700 words per page, and let's say there's 10 pages of bills on average that passed, that's 4,424,000 words that passed the legislature this year. Think about that. 4,424 words. And our two speakers today read every single one of those words, right? 
No, probably not. I'm very pleased to have uh, with us today two speakers. I'm going to let Warner introduce them. Um, being an elected official um, is a wonderful experience and probably the hardest thing ever at the same time. Joy, not like giving birth, but it feels like that because there's a lot of joy for a long period of time, but it's a struggle all the way through. So Warner Allen, would you like to introduce our speakers, please? So every time the legislature meets, um, being a lawyer, I feel like that's the Full Employment Act uh, because there's all kinds of new stuff we get to deal with. That said, um, Senate President Pro Tem and freshman Republican in the super minority, two per opposite experiences, both elected and sent to Salem to serve their different uh, constituencies. Today, we will hear their views on the legislative session from their perspective, a seasoned senator and elected leader in a supermajority, and a newly elected representative in a super minority. Senator Monarch Anderson has served our local area at the state level since 2004. When she was elected state representative, she also served in the Gresham Barlow School Board. Holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Radford University, a Bachelor of Biology from Willamette, and a Master's of Biology from the University of Colorado. She spent her working career as a public health nurse, and when not working, she says she's an avid golfer, bless you. <laughs> the senator attended Gresham High, loves to garden, really loves to read, captivating fiction last year during an interview by the chamber that took place for last year's chamber directory. She was on her 103rd book for the year. Also in that article, Senator said, I quote, caring for people has been my lifelong career. Now as a public servant, it is an honor to represent and serve my hometown and lifelong friends as Oregon's state senator. Currently, Senator President Pro Tem and past chair of many committees, committees rather in health and veterans issues, please welcome our local state senator, Boris Manas Anderson. Thank you. I was uh, delighted to be talking with our good representative from the Canby area um, earlier, and uh, we decided I'd go first because I will be happy, and she she will be sad. <laughs> uh, I am so honored to be able to represent this community, and it's a really diverse communi community. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of questions that you may have. I'm going to just go as quickly as I can over some of the things that were important to me and, uh, and then certainly open it up for questions um, after our good representative has a chance to speak because um, I'm really interested to get your feedback. Um, housing is the most critical issue in this district. When I was campaigning in 2016, and by the way, I am not running in 20, um, uh, this next election cycle in 2020, just to put that on the record. I've been saying that since my last uh, run in 2016. And already there have been many people that are wanting to run for the position, as I understand. We'll see how that turns out. But ho housing is uh, the issue. And um, uh, we did pass the renter's protection bill and I'm not going to go into the details but uh, and but then we also passed a number of bills um, because housing in our area is really not affordable for so many people um, I was extremely pleased and happy um, to sponsor many of those bills and um, and I am hoping that it will relieve uh, some of the angst with some of the constituents that we have that live in the Gresham area. And when you are uh, talking with a retired person who lives only on Social Security and they their rents doubled, they had been paying $450 a month and now it's jumped to $900 a month. Um, 
they can't afford it, especially if their income is only like 1200 or 12, um, 1500 a month. So I want to put that in, in that context of why I have always been a strong supporter of housing. Healthcare, of course, is my passion. I'm a retired public health nurse. And uh, we did work on uh, prescription uh, drug equity. And I was so happy to work with uh, Representative Teresa Alonzo Leon in the House on two bills. Um, there are many of my patients, even, that could not read their labels because it wasn't their language. And for someone to take the medication wrong is worse than taking the medication at all. And so we now, the um, Board of Pharmacy will be working on implementing, um, providing this in other languages, as well as for those who are blind. Um, there are technology out there, and not expensive either, especially some of these companies, they pay for the technology um, so that those who are blind also have more access. So that I was extremely happy about. Going to, um, I won't go over patient safety, you can go over that, and the public health in, in investments. Um, this is a bill that um, one of the senators, um, it's the wireless one. I am one of those who still feel that there may be, may be some concern from the radiation that comes off of our cell phones, our iPads, our computers, our wireless networks. The, especially with our children, I'm not so worried about us adults, but a ch child's cranium is much thinner and they're now in schools where they're, that, there's wireless there. And I really feel we need to be doing some research to find out, is this having an effect on the development of the brain? And so it, all it is is a study, and it will require the Oregon Health Authority to do a literature review to find out and get some information and maybe make recommendations to the T Department of Ed. Um, another constituent, um, Wife died uh, while whitewater rafting and has been a strong proponent of the helmet, of at least offering helmets. And so Chris Gorsuch and I were able to pass that legislation finally after three tries uh, this session. Um, I am extremely happy uh, that we passed a bill that you will all be voting on, and that is a measure to increase the tax on cigarettes, to form a tax on e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes is now so, um, it is used by our youth uh, more than it should be. And, uh, and so we needed to make sure that we can curtail, cur curtail that. So um, you will be voting. And that money, uh, if, you, uh, if you decide to raise that tax, it will then put us on the par with Washington, the state of Washington's tax, and the same with California. But research shows that it does decrease um, the amount, those to, who um, would try to use it, especially among the youth. And so I'm hoping that you will vote for that um, because the amount of money that our Medicaid program pays, f because 35% of our Medi Medicaid patients are smokers, uh, we are paying millions and millions of dollars for health care uh, for them as a result of the side effects from, from smoking. Um, we've been working on prescription drug costs. It's so hard to make any, any in, dance in that. That is really a federal issue, but we were able to pass some legislation to pro so that pharmacies would be more transparent. I am extremely excited about um, passing the Student Success Act. It is a tax, a corporate tax, that will provide money a uh, billion dollars a year uh, to our school system K through 12. And so um, this has been something that we have been wanting to do for years, especially since Measure 5 and the state 
uh, the local jurisdiction didn't have control over the, the of the budgets for their schools. So I'm happy about that. And I'm also excited the fact that our community colleges, which are vital to our communities, um, are now going to be able to offer a baccalaureate degree program. And um, I am very upset with our university system. I, I have not been shy about saying that. Attendance is decreasing in our university system, and they are not stepping to the plate. They only want more and more money. Um, we need to be working to make sure that we don't have our students coming out of their education with such huge debts that they are moving back, living with their parents, um, just so that they can start paying off their debt. Um, going to the environment, uh, we, ha we established some goals to promote zero emission vehicles uh, and, uh, re and also we passed a bill re requiring motor vehicle users in Multnomah County, Clackamas and Washington to transition to clean diesel fuels. So there was, a, um, and then the single use plastic bag and the single use plastic straws are now ba banned. Um, those were all environmental, but I know the big one was carbon emission. And as you probably have heard, I was one of the three Democrats that felt that uh, this um, wasn't quite the bill that we maybe should have passed. I have been a strong, strong supporter of um, the environment, clean water, clean air, et cetera. But I also felt strongly that it needed to be fair. There should not be win winners or losers with the uh, bill that uh, um, that was being proposed. The final amendment, the Dash 101s, were finally adopted about two weeks, three weeks before the end of session. And after understanding that and talking with some businesses, um, as well as um, working families, this isn't just. I mean, your taxes would probably increase about 26% for gas. Fam average family would be paying about, I think I, it was a $1,500 a year. Um, those were issues that I felt needed to be addressed more, f thought about more thoughtfully. Uh, and also to come to some consensus with the Republicans. I, I truly felt there was arrogance the fact that we have supermajorities in both the Senate and the House, uh, all of a sudden it seemed like we don't need, the feeling is we don't need to work with the other side. And I'm totally opposed to that and always have been. And I know it's happening at the national level too. Um, but um, I don't have any qualms about voting no. I do not know what's going to happen in 2020. But if you have more questions, certainly ask, ask me later on. How much time do I have? You have at least 10 more minutes. How many? 10. Oh, okay, then I'm all right. And if I end early, that's fine. Um, so I am, uh, PERS is another big issue that many of you are interested in. And um, again, some parts of the bill are going to be challenged. Um, but I do want you all to know that the PERS reforms that we made only affect 1% of the employees. So I think that is being lost in um, um, the discussion here. What it will do is it's going to reduce um, rate increases that our employers, like our schools and our cities, are going to have to pay. It's called contribution rates. And it's making changes to the savings plan. And it re, it, this is what's controversial. It'll, it'll redirect some of the employees' savings. Um, and, uh, and that, what they're claiming is then they, they will not have as much money in their benefit when uh, they retire. So that the courts are going to analyze and look at. But it does, um, my bill, which they incorporated into the PERS bill, uh, it removes the um, limited number of hours that 
PERS employees get to work. For instance, you can't work more than 1,039 hours. And so what our, our good employees have been doing once they retire is uh, go over to the state of Washington to teach. And why not keep some of those that our schools really need? It does, this will allow them to teach. It will allow them to retire. Some say it's double dipping because they'll get their salary and their retirement. But the school, um, I, I don't look at it that way at all because the schools will still have to pay into the PERS for them. We set it up so that they would still have to pay um, PERS for them. So it is very complicated, but I was extremely excited to um, vote for that. Also, um, your benefits are determined on the last three years of your, your salaries um, that you've worked, and uh, we've capped that, and this is what it's going to be challenged in the courts too. So after, um, they will only average your final benefit package on the last three years that does not go over $195,000 a, a year. So that is capped. So you're not going to see these huge, you know, $50,000, $60,000 a month um, pension rewards to some of our employees. So that, to me, is a good thing, too. Do not know what the courts will say, but I will, I will let you know that I was extremely proud but um, there are people that are definitely going to, that are not proud. Um, I was happy to also um, vote for our juvenile justice bill. Senator Winters, this was one of her bills where we have our youth that have committed offenses get second chances. And I know a couple of people in our district, their kids um, really went off the wall and, and, and committed crimes that they shouldn't. One of them uh, did earn his college degree in jail. Uh, he had to spend 11 years in jail. But there are a number of instances where some of these youth need second chances. Um, and they will become, and they'll still become good citizens. So again, uh, I was happy to vote for that. Some of you may be excited or not excited about the paid family leave. Uh, again, um, the employer will need to pay 40% uh, into the system, and 60% will be paid. Uh, by the employee. Um, most other states, the employee employees, um, pays in the entire amount. And the reason the Republicans, at least in the Senate, wanted to make sure that um, we pass this in the legislature is because uh, they were going to put an initiative before the voters that would have the employee pay 100% into the paid family leave program. And businesses definitely did not want that. And it pulled very high. And so that is why uh, we, we went forward and the Republicans let it go in the Senate. They didn't vote for it, but they let it go. Um, um, one of the reasons that I, um, was a no on the carbon bill is um, the Republicans weren't coming back. They were not going to come back unless they were guaranteed that the carbon bill would not go to the floor. And so um, I already uh, had made this decision. Well, I hadn't really made a decision. I know that. Um, Tim Canope, a Republican from Ben, came to me and said, before they walked out, are you going to be a no lawyer? I said, I, I can't tell you yet. I keep thinking we're going to be able to get some amendments that will make this more palatable. And, and, they, and it didn't happen. But also, if we didn't get the Republicans to come back, and if I hadn't been a no, none of the budget would have passed most of the budget wouldn't have passed. We wouldn't have gotten paid family leave. We wouldn't have gotten um, um, House Bill 2015, which eliminates the requirement that a, a person has to ha provide proof of citizenship or residency in the United States to get a driver's license. There were so many bills that wouldn't pass. 
especially those for Gresham. And if you look at East County successes, um, the ones that I'm most excited about is Senate Bill 5050. I, early on, wanted $2.3 million to build a school-based health center at Reynolds High School. And we got the full amount. I think it's because I'm a lame duck. I'm going out, and they wanted to make sure that I got what I wanted <laughs> for my community. I'm extremely excited about that. Um, I had worked with the superintendent at, uh, when I first met her, and I asked her, what would you like? And she said, a school-based health center. And I said, I was a school-based health center nurse for Oregon City High School for 17 years. Yes, I think that's an excellent idea. And so they are going to have a school-based health center, which will be extremely valuable. Uh, also, um, the Graydon, Gresham's Graydon Sports Park. I think over 28,000 kids use Graydon Sports Park every year. And we don't have bathrooms, we need concession stands, we need two, I think two more uh, softball fields, we need two more soccer fields. We need so much more. And so I had asked for five million, but I got two point a little over two million and then of course we got money uh, for the gang enforcement team so I am extremely excited uh, for me as a person uh, for my community the kids are extremely important I was successful in getting bills that were important to me and I think m most of the bills are going to really help Oregonians so I thank you and I want to turn it over to Warren that will introduce our good representative. Thank you, Senator. Representative Christine Drazen, full circle. That might describe Representative Drazen's Salem experiences. In the 1990s and early 2000s, Representative Drazen was a top staffer to Republican leaders in the legislature. At that time, the Republicans were in the majority in the House and the Senate, and she was Chief of Staff to the Speaker of the House, Mark Simons. She loved serving Oregonians in her staff role, and she loved the process and the results of hard work. Christine returned home to focus her attention on local schools, working with small businesses and nonprofits. Some of her many volunteer activities included being appointed to serve on the Canby School District Budget Committee and the Clackamas County Planning Commission. She also served on the board of the local PTA, established student council in her children's school, and started a kids governor civics program. Professionally, Christine is an executive director of a statewide nonprofit that supports preservation of Oregon's history and culture. A fourth generation Oregonian, she graduated from George Fox University, loves traveling and adventuring with her husband and her three children. The representative returned to Salem having been elected to 2018 in the House District 39. She went to Salem knowing more about the process than most freshmen do, so she hit the ground running. She made promises to those that elected her, and she was determined to represent the Oregonians that elected her. Her supermajority presents a very difficult and often hostile environment. When to compromise, when to say no, what impact can a senator in the super minority have? You're about to meet someone who's had an impact in Salem, even under all those circumstances, articulate and smart. Please welcome Representative Christine Drazen. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. That was a very kind introduction. And thanks, everybody, for having me here today. I'm short, so I'm going to adjust that quick. So I love doing these events and talking to the community about session. This is the first one I've done where I'm not actually in my own district. So I feel like I'm standing in today for Senator Thompson, which I'm happy to do, though he's a ton funnier than me. If you guys have had him here before, he, uh, he, ha he has a way of making everything uh, more lighthearted. And I was telling Senator Monis Anderson as we were walking up that, you know, sometimes I look at these things and I'm not quite sure how to talk about this session. Uh, because it was, in fact, quite an opportunity for me to jump back into politics. Uh, 
Uh, as was mentioned, I really view this role in this service as a continuation of everything else I've done in my adult life, which is to serve Oregon, and to serve Oregon uh, and to further the to further good government values across our whole state, whether or not that was as a staffer or on behalf of a nonprofit or working with small businesses. There's always a way to do your part and to contribute. And uh, working on the Planning Commission has certainly been an amazing opportunity, too, to really see some of the burdens that businesses of all shapes and sizes and people face when they go through the process of growing and developing and, and engaging with our land use system. So serving in the legislature for me, when I first ran, one of the things that, that struck me when I, when I was going door to door was the extent to which absolutely everybody wanted to talk to me about health care. Uh, Senator Monis Anderson is a nurse by trade. I have no such connections. But everybody wanted to talk about it. They wanted to talk about the price of their prescription drugs. They wanted to talk about whether or not they had decent access when they needed it to their doctors. They wanted to talk about their VA care, whether or not they could get to their medical appointments. It felt like, I mean, at first I thought, oh, well, that was interesting. That was an interesting conversation. And then it just kept happening and happening and happening. People wanted to talk about their health care. And so when, it, when I had the opportunity to uh, request my committee assignments, I asked to serve on the health care committee. And so Senator Monis Anderson's um, uh, rundown on the work that was done around health care this session is familiar to me because I served on that committee this cycle. And my exposure to that was interesting when Pat Allen, who's the director of the Oregon Health Authority, came before our committee and um, kind of gave sort of a 101. There were a lot of new members on that committee about the structure of uh, how we provide health care services in Oregon, primarily through coordinated care organizations. He said that health care in Oregon is organic. And I thought that was a very apt description because I was going in thinking, okay, this is broken. Let's just change out this piece. Let's just modernize this equipment. Let's just innovate. And we will have a better healthcare system. But the reality is it was an awful lot closer to cutting off an arm or asking to just, you know, take out a vital organ. When you, when you try to make substantial changes that aren't incremental and aren't compromise-based changes around healthcare, it, it has the potential to have substantial un unintended consequences. And so the approach around healthcare I found to be steady on, to be slow and steady. Here's the broad goal. How do we get there through consensus? How can we get there by working with the partners and the people who provide those services to continue to make gains? And I think a lot of the work that happened in the healthcare committee on the House side, at least this session, was intended to go towards that end. And so I actually think there's a lot more work to do there, but I definitely don't think it's going to be easy. A lot of it is absolutely federal issues. And uh, a lot of what we do in Oregon requires federal waivers and all of those kinds of things. Um, but it's important work, and I don't think we're there yet. I don't think that Oregonians yet feel like, despite the massive costs uh, that we all pay for health care privately and through our taxes for folks that are on the Oregon Health Plan, I don't feel like our system has arrived yet. So I look forward to continuing that, uh, that work. So that's my ease into my approach towards session because the health care committee was so important to my constituents and my district and I would take the leap of faith that it's also important to your community and your employees and your businesses. But now I'm going to jump into session. <laughs> and I got to say that it is a pleasure to stand here today with Senator Monis Anderson because the session really was partisan in a way that I've never seen before. When I was Chief of Staff to Oregon Speaker of the House, we did. We had Republican majorities in the House and the Senate, but we had a Democrat governor, which meant that we worked across party lines. We had to get a budget passed. It's constitutionally mandated. You have to work with the other party to get the signature of the governor and not to have the bulk of your budget line item vetoed. And so we worked across the aisle. This session was an example of extreme power uh, really exerted casually. Not in a way that was hurtful, wasn't intentionally exclusive in a way that was mean-spirited. It was just the casual exercise of absolute power. 
I was talking to a committee chair after the session and I said, I loved, I was talking about a particular bill, I love that bill, that was such a great bill. Why didn't it make it out of your committee? It had no fiscal impact, meaning there was no expense associated with it. It had no opposition. Why didn't that one move? Because we could. There was no other reason. It was a Republican on the bill. There were Democrats, but they weren't senior Democrats. They were freshmen. And there was just no reason to do anything to move that bill forward. There was nothing at play there. There was no leverage, so they just let the bill die. That was my experience this session. And so even though, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I only voted against, I think, 67, 68 bills all session long. Out of the 700 that moved across the House floor, I only voted against 67 of those bills. Which means that a lot of those bills, I worked really hard to find something I could support in there. And if I could support it, if the basic premise was something that I could get behind that didn't harm our community, that advanced a broad policy goal, I voted for that bill. Because I wanted to be bipartisan. And I wanted to represent both sides within my own community. But I'm telling you, those 67 bills that I voted against were very consequential for our state. I voted against cap and trade. I've had the opportunity to talk about that particular bill in a lot of different settings. And the reason that I voted against that, cap and, that bill was because it was not an Oregon solution. It just wasn't. The Western Climate Initiative was the group that we would be joining, and that particular organization was already in place, of course, had their own rules, their own standards for what it would mean to join them to be able to buy, sell, and trade um, our carbon allowances in that setting. And in addition to that, they would have applied all kinds of other rules to what was allowed for credits for sequestration and all these kinds of other things that fit other, um, other farmlands, I mean other forest lands that weren't organs, different kinds of trees and different kinds of like terms at which they need to stay in the ground and grow and all kinds of other really technical things that made that completely unworkable for Oregon. In addition to that, that legislation had substantial features that were unconstitutional and I couldn't get past that. Um, the, the bill assumes at a very core level that you're going to reduce carbon emissions because you're going to drive up the cost of energy. That's the basic premise of this bill. And it, I mean, there's going to be opportunities for you to offset that with credits if you're certain kinds of folks. But for everyday Oregonians, 75 to 80 percent of the money that was brought in by that bill would be because we drive cars still that may not be electric. And we turn on our natural gas inside our homes to cook our food and heat our homes. And 40% increase in the cost it would take to heat our homes for folks on fixed incomes that are already facing increased costs for in other areas of their lives is just not working for me. That's not okay. And there was no way to mitigate that. If you want to join the Western Climate Initiative, you have to have these certain features in the legislation. And the goal was to join the Western Climate Initiative. And so there was no way to mitigate the unconstitutional nature of that bill. There was no way to address the concerns for increases for cost of living for Oregonians if we were going to join the Western Climate Initiative. All of these things were out of our control, which is why there couldn't, in fact, be amendments at the end. Because you had to balance the, the expectations of folks who wanted to be all in with no changes and no carve-outs and the people who wanted this to be workable for Oregonians and the people who wanted to join the Western Climate Initiative. And so we had no way to move. There was no wiggle room on that legislation. It was unconstitutional because in Oregon, if you tax natural gas, you know how I said if you turn on your natural gas in your home, it was going to increase the cost for that? In Oregon, if you tax natural gas, it, it has to be capped at 6%. That's in our Constitution, strangely enough. And then that money has to be dedicated to schools. It goes into the Common School Fund in Oregon. Well, the cap and trade bill would have diverted it into climate mitigation. In, in Oregon, we have all kinds of protections where we dedicate the gas tax to roads. We want to have good working roads in Oregon. We have tons of congestion around here. We need every dime to go into figuring out how we're going to get from here to there uh, without spending any more time in our cars than we have to. But that legislation would have taken that money that should have been directed to our highway trust fund and it would have directed it to climate mitigation. I personally don't think it's good enough to say that your gas tax dollars that are raised under the cap and trade proposal, it's not good enough to say that that's going to go for culverts. That money is intended for roads. 
And to look at it in any other way shortchanges all of us as Oregonians. And frankly, I felt like it was unconstitutional. They also raised substantial funds in that bill, as we talked about, which, and they did not require themselves to have a supermajority. In Oregon, our constitution requires that. If you're gonna raise taxes, it means you have to pass that through both chambers with a three-fifths vote. And in the Senate, and in the House, that bill did not have a requirement that it passed with a three-fifths vote. So in so many ways, on so many levels, that was just a bad piece of legislation. It was not the right answer to those of us who care about clean air, clean water, and who want to reduce our carbon footprint in Oregon. It was just the wrong solution to a real problem. And so I'm really thankful that Senator Monis Anderson was a no on that bill. I personally believe for a whole bunch of reasons, structurally, philosophically, that that was in fact the right choice. I voted no on that bill, and I'm telling you, my no vote meant nothing compared to her no vote. So it's very, very important to recognize that sometimes people can have really good intentions, but they can, in fact, without balance, without a need to really work together, without a commitment to compromise, you can take something that is a shared problem where we want to achieve a shared solution, and you can end up on the wrong path. And that, in fact, is what happened with cap and trade. If I had to guess, I would guess and say that cap and trade will be back in 2020. And I will guess, given the limitations that I know exist for folks who want to join the Western Climate Initiative, that it's probably unlikely that it'll be that much different from what it was that we saw in 2019. And I hope that instead of approaching it in the same way, maybe we can approach it differently and say, is there a way to compromise? Can we make this legislation something that works for Oregon? Or is there an alternative solution? And so I look forward to having those conversations. I am committed to approaching my service all about good government. And good government is not government is the solution for absolutely everything. We have to figure out where are the limits. Do we have limits? I think we should. And I think that government should do what it is required to do, its core functions, beautifully. I think it should do it efficiently. I think it should do it in a way that uses tax dollars wisely and provides value to our citizens of our state. But I don't think that if we can't figure out what government is about and what we're supposed to do, that we will do anything well because we will be trying to do too much all at once. And it will put more pressure on taxpayers and it will put more pressure on core services where too many folks are trying to compete with the things that we're actually trying to do when we're working way outside the edges of what government actually can do. Government cannot be everything to everybody effectively, and I don't think we want it to be. I think we want to return to a time where government does the work of public service well, and that in fact we partner with community members and nonprofits and families and churches and civic organizations to lead in other categories, and we, ha and we find our way to support that work. So I look forward to the 2020 session. I would expect it's gonna be hard again. Um, I have to say that this session was a difficult session to come back into, um, but I did find opportunities to work with folks, and I, I know that Senator Modest Anderson, when she ran through the listing of things she got for her district, it was in the millions. Mine was in the hundreds of thousands, but I was happy to bring some things home to my community as well. There was good work that happened this session. When you talk about requiring pharmaceuticals to notify folks 60 days out if they're gonna increase the cost of drugs by 10% or more, that's important. That is absolutely landmark. We have to continue to move down that road. Uh, we did good things to protect kids in our schools for the first time ever we now require folks who are investigating abuse in their schools for those employees, they can't just quit and go apply at another school and not have that investigation follow them. I mean, you would think that that was intuitive, that we were protecting our kids that way, but this session was the first session we got that work done. And we, did, we provided similar protections for daycares for the first time. So if you are accused of abuse, that investigation prevents you from working in another daycare. If you have to report as a sexual predator, that prevents you from working with kids. You would think all this stuff had been in place for ages and ages, but it got done this session. So even though it was a very difficult session for those 67 bills I voted against, I have to say that the rest of the legislation that we passed, some really, really strong legislation was put in place in other categories, and it was a real privilege to be there. So thank you for having me today.
Is this on? Am I, can you hear me? Um, actually, why don't both of you stay up there? Um, Senator, why don't you go up there and we're gonna have questions. I'm assuming there's going to be at least one question from somebody. Okay, Robin has the first question. She's a sponsor of the event, so answer the question nicely. Good afternoon, ladies. Um, I, my question is this, there is a real problem with the homelessness for sure, but what steps is the legislature taking to deal with the mental illness as opposed to forcing, you know, affordable housing when you've got people that don't want to live in a house? Um, that is not an easy answer. Uh, there's not an easy answer to that. But what is exciting uh, that we passed, I think it was Senate Bill 3 um, regarding mental health, behavioral health, and putting a lot of money, and that's what we do. We put a lot of money in, and then the local jurisdictions will come up with a plan on how they are going to address the mental illness issue, the homelessness issue in their jurisdiction. So we didn't get down and say this is what you need to do because each community is different. And um, so that's the tack that we did and I could go through the budget and through all of the money that is targeted for mental illness, for behavioral health, for drug and alcohol, um, for the types of housing. But that's what we did, and maybe um, Christy has something a little more to add. Thank you. Just really briefly, the House uh, just announced its interim committees, and for our health care committee, we now have a subcommittee on mental health, which I'm really excited about that it's been formed, recognizing that putting a lot of money into affordable housing and, how, and um, supports for homeless is not going to fully answer this question. But so you know how I was saying I got a little bit of money from my district. One of my, um, one of my things that I'm most excited about is $300,000 to work with Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon to specifically support homeless youth um, throughout Clackamas County. And I think that that's going to be really, really important funds well spent because when they can get one of our uh, unaccompanied and homeless youth into a second home, their graduation rates that they are able to achieve are at 98%, so that's very exciting. And also for Clackamas County, we are the only county in the state, my district, that um, that actually put in through the Planning Commission specific language around where we can put um, homeless villages on county property. And so the Veterans Village is in my legislative district and I was proud to be a part of that, but it doesn't answer the question of mental health and mental health supports. But in the House, at least, we're beginning to have really focused work on that issue. Another and question? Also, the oh. Senate has now has a separate committee starting in 2020, mental health. Uh, I am on that committee, um, but uh, just focus on the mental health. It's a huge, one out of five, um, people have a mental health I issue. One nice thing that we did for the schools is now kids can take, can be excused for mental health reasons. And in my case, in my family, having a, a son who has bipolar, uh, extremely important because uh, I am very, very uh, committed to uh, wanting to solve some of these problems and actually address them, we are floundering and everyone is so afraid uh, of mental illness because you hear about the shootings and it's a mental health person. There's a lot of work that we have to do. Thank you for the question, Robin. Lila has a question. I see seven million dollars here just in a little paragraph and that I know is just a tip of the iceberg. My question to you ladies is how can we get some accountability for these things? I see $2 million, $2,400,000 for the health center, but what are they going to use it for? Because I have a small budget, I guess, and to me that seems overwhelming. So I'd just like to see uh, some. I like our ways and means process because when you ask for money, you have to have a detail, like let's take rentals. They had to come forward with exactly how much it was going to cost to build that, where the money went. And so it was, 
they have to be held accountable, the, they have to have outcomes, and so that money actually was the budget to build. It was a capital construction budget. So for, for that, now others where we're giving a lot of money to mental health, et cetera, again, they have to be accountable that, for that money. If they, they have to apply for the money, they have to have a, a plan. So every, every penny, you are supposed to be held accountable and there have to be outcomes. And I know a lot of people need to have um, would like, I think Sue O'Halloran, she's not here, uh, said it would be nice if we had uh, what the accountability was, what happened to that money, and how was it used, and that's something that we could do easily. So, Lila, to your point, though, I think when you're talking about capital projects, I think we, I think the standards around the capital projects are very extensive. I mean, you're borrowing for a 30-year term, what's the return on investment, all that kind of stuff is clear. But to your point, I think that the area where there, it's more fuzzy and where we really, really need to get our arms around it better, in my sense, are things like... Uh, the Department of Education, the Oregon Health Authority. So if you look at the Department of Education, that particular budget, and not the K-12 budget, not our school's budget, but the Department of Education budget, I was on the Ways and Means Education sub. Their budget grew by 75% in four years. <laughs> How does that even happen? Like, it's an agency. How could you grow by that much? Mm -hmm. They distribute more than 4,000 grants, making our school districts chase after money year after year after year all through the Department of Education. Now they perform some important functions as far as coordination and tracking teacher training and they do a lot of really important stuff for our schools. But if you just take a look at that one agency, the growth in that one agency budget, where is the accountability? What is the return on investments? All of our agencies have things called key performance measures and the key performance measures are supposed to provide that accountability where we say, did you do what you said you would do? But in the case of education specifically, as you know, education's all local. And whether or not kids graduate from a local school has a lot more to do with your local school boards than it does the Oregon Department of Education. But for some reason, their key performance measures are still tracking to things like graduation rates. And so their accountability, uh, their lines of accountability to me aren't clear enough for what they're actually given money to accomplish. And I think we have a lot of room to improve on a lot of these agencies specifically in how they spend money. Thank you. Lori, you have a question? Lori's from a nonprofit, outside in, inside out, inside, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, I was really happy to see um, some movement last year and this year on zoning and um, land use, especially the COTEC bill. I think, you know, that'll help us get to more um, affordable housing in the state. I'm wondering what do you see on the horizon next year for additional changes and improvements to our land use and zoning challenges? That's not my area, uh, so I can't address the uh, zoning. There are people out there that are gonna come forward, I'm sure, with a lot of, of uh, legislation, but um, we have, um, we really won't know what's going to be there until those bills come out. And no one's talked to me about it. And so just, I'm, I'm sure it sounds like you would know about, you already know about this kind of stuff, but I mean they did be, not just for the middle housing and all that other stuff that moved in this prior session, but even prior to that they allowed, um, they allowed ADUs, yeah, you know, and urban growth boundaries, and then they, they loosened that up even more in the rural areas with two acres or more. Mm -hmm. And so they are, I think that there is some work being done to continue to address that problem, but like Senator Monis Anderson said, it's not a clear known path, at least for me so far, but I do think that there are a lot of folks who are doing their absolute best to work through these issues in a way that's responsive to Oregon's land use system, which has been around since the 70s, um, and, and should continue to improve and grow over time, and protecting that system and the value of that system while still acknowledging we, we need to uh, make room for other people to live here. Tudy has a question. Thank you. Regarding the vaccination bill that was so controversial, can you explain why that was so controversial and will it be back in February? <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Uh, I just met with the chair of the uh, House uh, Healthcare Committee, Andrew Salinas, yesterday. 
and I said, um, we cannot have anything as controversial as the vaccine bill was last time because uh, she had told me we need to start it in the Senate. And I, and I told her, I am not going to do it in 2020, uh, um, but I'm going to be talking with um, Senator Steiner Hayward because she was the one who, who really um, took it. I, I, if I have my way, it will not be in my committee, so. And I guess all I can say about that, it was controversial on its face, right? That would have taken away the religious exemption, which you might think religious freedom is a constitutional protect, constitutionally protected freedom. And, um, and it took a system that's currently working in Oregon, and uh, it further limited it. And so I think it was mostly response from parents who said, I want to be able to parent my own children and make those choices, uh, more so than it was a response to whether or not uh, people should vaccinate, which for the record, people should vaccinate. We should all vaccinate. Vaccines are safe, let's vaccinate. But parents need to be able to uh, make those choices for their kids, and I think that that's where the controversy came in. So, thank you. Although I do like what Washington did, and if a bill came forward, and that, that would be to require um, measles. Uh, my sister is deaf, um, because my mom had the measles when she was pregnant back in the 40s. And so I would not mind having a, a mandate for, for the measles um, and let your physician, though, decide whether there is an opt-out for um, medical reasons. Thank you. Scott has a question. So this question kind of stems from an article that was uh, in The Oregonian about a month ago when auditors in January found 1,900, kind of goes hand in hand with Lila's question on transparency, but when auditors checked and found 1,900 double filled positions, uh, 24, uh, I think 24 fills for one position within DHS for a position that was listed as one employee, so that means 24 people in that one single allotted budgeted line item uh, job what sort of actions are going to be taken um, to assure us that, I mean, this is millions of dollars uh, in over, overfilling positions? Uh, and that, I, when I was working for Clackamas County Public Health, that was an issue. The agencies would put forward uh, double positions so that they would need to be funded uh, and, and they didn't have people to fill them. Is that what you're... Yeah, I guess yes. I'm, I'm like work Clackamas County Mental Health as well. <laughs> oh. but, and I understand the strain on those organizations, but we have a budget for these organizations. So what can legislature do to assure accountability that, I mean, here we continue to tax and tax and tax, yet we're seeing this level of waste from state organizations. Um, that's a huge level of waste. Um, what are we doing to assure these things aren't happening? I'm not a ways and means person. I w Did you serve on ways and means? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Easy out for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, could you even believe that article when you read it? No. Like, who operates that way? So, the Oregon Health Authority is massive. Our whole budget's only $85 billion. The Oregon Health Authority's portion of that is pushing $25 billion of that $85 billion for one agency. They have, you know, they have 4,000 employees, and as the audit found, um, those positions are massively overfilled. Uh, the agency is in a position, I think, where when it moves through the ways and means process, it will have to account for those positions differently. Now that the audit has been done, now that it's public, they will not be able to do business as usual anymore. That will, not, that will not fly. It doesn't mean that they won't end up funding those positions, that those, they won't discover or decide from a policy position that they need to have that work done, um, but they will not be able to operate that way any longer. We have time for one last question and two short answers. Um, to go along with the question you were asking, I noticed that Secretary of State Bev Clarno did a audit and they found that in order to use up all of the uh, budget for certain departments that they were hiring extra help that they supposedly didn't need. How do we guard against that? 
That is a timeless problem. I think that's been going on and on and on and on. And I think you just have to be vigilant. Um, our Ways and Means process in Oregon really has the capacity to be very, very rigorous. The Legislative Fiscal Office is a nonpartisan office that uh, operates year-round, that serves legislators and helps uh, really identify within agencies where these problems are within budgets. And they are a great office and they provide extraordinary service. And so it's just being vigilant and it's just being on top of it. I mean, there's a reason we have the Secretary of State and they do audits and they bring this information forward because sometimes after we pass budgets, after they go through the rigorous session, and after the work is done with legislative fiscal, we need more. We need follow-up. And the Secretary of State's office does an incredible job helping us with that. Okay. Weren't they great? Thank you so much. Uh, one, somebody took my paper. Warner, did you take my paper? My, my notes, they're all written on. I've got papers with no notes. Oh, that's not fine. Um, I do need them back. So, because I have messages on there. Nobody took them, I did. They were back there on the table. I didn't, I didn't threaten you, I just asked you if you took them. I have witnesses. Okay, what we, what we just witnessed, not with me, but the two women that were here. Guts, intelligent, thoughtfulness, courage, and dedication. I mean, the, both of them are so dedicated to their communities to look outside the box, to walk across the line, um, whatever that line is, whether it's a partisan line or a line to get something done. And I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, I knew Christine, I knew the representative when she was a staffer, and she was younger, and she ran circles around all of us old people that were there, and to watch her now, um, years later, as a mom and as, and as a gifted legislator, thank you. And Senator Monis Anderson, we didn't serve together, but I, I, we probably wouldn't have agreed on a whole lot of things. I so respect her. Um, I love to be around people that help me sharpen my sword. So she says one thing, I think the opposite. How could we sharpen the sword and get to know each other better and then work on the legislation? And that's what I've always appreciated about Senator Monis Anderson. So I'm grateful that both of you are here today and that you represent Oregon the way that you do. Because it's not just Gresham and it's not just Canby, it's all of Oregon. We are symptomatic of the whole state. So thank you both very much. Um, I want to let you know about some things that are coming up next month. Our speaker at this luncheon is Lynn Peterson, the Metro Chair. On October 17th is our business summit, and it's Lessons from the Mouse House. Um, Pete Blank is going to be here from the Disney University. You can register online. The title of our summit is Beyond Business as Usual. Disney's approach to business excellence. It's not a retail type speech, it's about leadership, it's about employee engagement. Um, that's, it, he's a national speaker, he has 13 years at Disney and 12 years in local government. He manages over 700 employees. So he has 25 years of stories, ideas, and experiences to help us become better managers, supervisors, employees, and leaders to be the best that we can be. And he does all of this with humor. I don't bring anybody into a business summit that can't laugh at himself. And that he, Pete does, and he will be very humorous and insightful and engaging. He's gonna join us for the business summit. You can reserve a table online, and we do expect this to be a sold out event. We already have a lot of registrations, but even though it's gonna be a sold out event, we are offering early, um, early bird pricing, but only till the end of August at midnight. So we're shutting it off at midnight. Pick up your replay schedule for Better East. I also now want to thank our sponsors again. Columbia Bank, Portland General Electric, Gresham Barlow School District, and pick up that replay schedule from Metro East Community Media. With that, it's one o'clock. Have a great day. Thank you.